Our scripture lesson today is from the Old Testament book of Psalms. The first chapter, we read these three verses. The truly happy person doesn't follow wicked advice, doesn't stand on the road of sinners, and doesn't sit with the disrespectful. Instead of doing those things, these persons love the Lord's instruction and they recite God's instruction day and night. They are like a tree replanted by streams of water, which bears fruit at just the right time and whose leaves don't fade. Whatever they do succeeds. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, my dear friends, as I think about life and the future, I realize that there are, in our day and age, two investments that seem to be recession-proof and have been recession-proof for the last 20 or so odd years. Do you know what they are? Storage and security. Why storage? Well, Dr. Leonard Sweet says he thinks that storage is recession-proof because we bought so much stuff that we can't live with everything we purchased. So we have these storage units or our garages or our attics where we have visitation rights to see our stuff that we love so much which is exactly why security is recession-proof, because we have to protect all of our precious stuff. Now think about how many security systems we have, security systems everywhere. Modern cars have security systems. If you get too close to the car, the lights are going to flash and the horn's going to blink if you are not the one who can turn off the alarm. Our houses now have these ring doorbells where you don't even have to be at home to know that somebody's at your front door and you can see who's walking across the street in front of you. Our neighbors texted me the other day and said, your dog is on our front porch. We can tell because we can see it through our phone. Wow, security systems that monitor every single thing we do. We have security cards to give us access into buildings, and we have up to a million passwords and passcodes to get into our computer systems or to use our credit cards or debit cards anymore. And heaven forbid, if you forget your passwords and you can't get in to your own stuff, we are dedicated, totally dedicated to protecting our stuff. And the more and more unpredictable the world becomes, the more we want to invest in security measures. Now, when I look back in history, I realize that we are not the only people who are concerned about securing our stuff. When I think back in the Dark Ages, when it turned into the Middle Ages, one of the most precious commodities at that time was books. And the only people who had books were the highly educated and wealthy people, the elite society. And books were tucked away as treasures in monasteries, and monasteries were the only places that had libraries. Later on, if a community was wealthy enough, they might have one or two books that were chained to a stone pulpit in a church. And so, of course, one of those books that was chained to that stone pulpit in the church was the Bible. So that people could come and look at it and touch it and know what the Bible was. Chained to that church to secure it so that no one would steal it or take it away. Now, for those of you who are right here in the sanctuary, I want you to look right in front of you in the pews. And you're going to see in front of you at least two books. 
One is a hymnal, and the other one is a Bible. Within easy reach of your hands. And yet, how many of us reach into those pew racks and pick it up and open the cover and read the Bible? It is so easy for us to reach. And yet, how rarely do we open it up? Occasionally, I have been a pastor of a congregation where Bibles have walked out of the door. Somebody is sitting in a pew and I tell people to reach for the Bible to open it up and to read it. And they go, oh, there's not one in my pew. Somebody must have stolen it. And I'm like, well, good for them. Yay. Let's just go out and buy another one. If somebody wanted God's word and starved for God's word so much that they took a Bible home with them, it was a treasure to that person. You know, most Protestant churches do have Bibles in their pews ready for anyone who is hungry for God's Word to be able to reach out and open up the cover and read words of hope and words of life, words of love, words of forgiveness, words of grace, words of belonging contained in the pages of this book. And we have Bibles in our own language in churches around the globe because of the Protestant reformers who wanted to make sure that the Bible was translated from Greek and Hebrew and Latin into the common language of every person around the globe so that we could easily access these words of life that are contained in the scriptures. As Psalm chapter 1 just proclaimed to us, the life of righteousness is lived by those who follow God's instructions, who meditate on it and have it in their hearts and in their minds and in their spirits. Words and stories and prayers contained in the scripture give life to people. And so I wonder, how did this book that was so precious that it had to be chained to a stone pulpit becomes something that we don't read. Something that we ignore or that we look at and we think that reading it is akin to getting a root canal. No joke there. A lot of people think it is akin to getting a root canal. The excuses range from I don't have time to read it to I don't understand it to it's too difficult to does it really matter anyway. And I know that there are some people who say, well, that's why I go to church because the preacher is going to read the Bible and then the preacher is going to tell me what the Bible says and then I don't have to read it. But my friends... The way that the Bible is going to be most profitable for any of us is for us to read it ourselves and to wrestle with it ourselves. And so I'm going to be transparent with you today. As an ordained clergy person in the United Methodist Church, as someone who reads my Bible, many different translations of it, someone who learned Greek and Hebrew in seminary and reads occasionally those original languages to understand the scriptures. As a human being, as a fellow disciple of Jesus Christ, someone journeying in my faith, I also find myself in seasons of life where I am not reading the Bible just for me. I'll read it to know what to preach for you. But there are seasons when I do not read it just for me. To hear what God has to say to me. And so I know how life gets so busy and difficult for so many of us. That reading the scripture slides down 
on our priorities for the day. So I want to challenge myself and challenge you to begin every moment of every day with spending that first 15 minutes of the day reading scripture. A time of devotion to God. Your first 15 moments of each day. Read scripture. Sit in prayer. And don't fall into the trap that happens to so many of us. You read it and you say, okay, blah, 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 done. Got it done. But meditate upon it. Pause and reflect. One of the ways to help us dig into Scripture and to understand it better will be the Disciple Bible Study course that Austin will be starting next Sunday. And you'll have an opportunity. You can sign up for it later today or talk with her about it and learn more about it. But I also want to encourage you, if you want to join me in this challenge of getting to know the Bible better for you, not to study it and to theologize about it and to be able to recite chapter and verse to people, but to hear God's word for you to draw closer to God yourself, then I want you to email me or text me or call me. And we'll have a texting chat going on with one another about the insights that God has for us. And I can share with you my reading plan that I'm going to be using as we follow along in reading the scriptures. Because see, the truth is, the latest studies from Pew Research Center says that 88% of Americans have Bibles in their homes. And that the average person has four and a half Bibles. I'd like to see that half Bible. Go home and see how many copies of the Bible you have in your home. And how many you actually open up and use. Because so many of us have multiple copies of the Bible that are just sitting around the house, laying on the shelf but we don't spend time looking at the scriptures and reading them. And even though we know that 88% of Americans have Bibles in their home, and even though we are very aware that the children who we give Bibles to here at Washington Street probably already have Bibles in their home or their parents could afford to buy them a Bible, the church still believes that it's very important that when a child enters the third grade and is able to read well enough on their own, that the church presents to that child a Bible. And so we will be doing that next Sunday. We will be giving to our two third graders, and if there are any other third graders in the congregation who are visiting with us or connected with us, please let us know, and we want to give you a Bible too. And the reason we give these children a Bible is not because we don't think they have access to a Bible. We give them a Bible from the church because we are making a statement to these children and reminding ourselves as adults that this is God's word to the church. That the Bible is important for the life of the Christian faith and that we need to be familiar with the words of the scriptures ourselves, that the Bible is more than just a book. But to be sure, the Bible has been misunderstood and misused by many people. People challenge the Bible for profit. People use the Bible to position their political standings. People use the Bible as a weapon to put people in and put people out. And people make statements that they say are in the Bible that are not in the Bible. Amen. So here's a little test, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you a test. Which of these following statements is included in the Bible? Number one, cleanliness is next to godliness. Number two, God helps those who help themselves. Number three, confession is good for the soul. Number four, money is the root of all evil. 
Number five, honesty is the best policy. Which one of those or which ones of those were in the Bible? Oh, I've got a wise choir member here. One of our choir members said none of them. And that's true. None of them are in the Bible. And yet you may hear people say that these common phrases come from Scripture. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine recently about all of this, and he said that an educated person came into his office one day saying that he was no longer going to be a Methodist. And he said, why don't you want to be a Methodist any longer? Well, you Methodists, you don't believe in the Bible. And so my friend asked him, well, what do you mean we don't believe in the Bible? And he said, well, for one thing, you don't insist on the seven days of creation being seven 24-hour periods. You don't believe that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days and then rested on the seventh day. And for another thing, you ordain women as pastors. And Paul clearly said that women ought to be silent in the church. So my friend said he realized that he had already lost this person from the Methodist denomination. So he asked him, he said, well, as an educated person yourself, are you willing to ignore the generations of theological scholars and the centuries of language experts who clearly explain that there is more than one way to translate day in Genesis chapter 1. And do you not realize that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia that there is neither male nor female, slave nor free? And yet, the Apostle Paul also wrote that women should be silent in the church and that slaves should obey their masters? So which parts of Scripture are you going to interpret and believe and live by? And which parts are you going to question and try to understand the context and history and the real meaning of? My friends, our problem with reading the Scripture is we haven't spent enough time in understanding how to read the scriptures in understanding how to interpret the scriptures. We tend to versify the scriptures, quoting chapter and verse to people rather than reading the scriptures as a whole. And yet... If you go home and you look at your computer browser, you might see how many pages are opened on top of one another. Because we don't live life in a linear fashion. When you Google something and look at something, you might also see a pop-up on Facebook and then you might instant message somebody through Messenger at the same time. You've got multiple things going on that are tied to one another in some way. And the scriptures are all tied together. Reading a verse here and a verse there, we need to learn how to make the connections and weave the story together. And so I want to leave you with two concepts today that have helped me in my understanding of scripture. You see, I think I told you once before that I went to a very traditional conservative college my first year of college, a college that told me that women should not become pastors. A college where one of my professors told me I could be a pastor's wife, but never a pastor. And so my understanding of scripture got questioned very early on I had to try to wrestle with understanding 
What does it mean that the Bible is the inspired word of God? And this one word, that it is the revelation of God, stuck with me. Revelation. You see, the only thing that you know about me is what I choose to reveal to you about myself. The only thing I know about you is what you choose to reveal to me about yourself. So I can make assumptions about you based on the actions and the things that I see, but if you reveal to me your thoughts, your feelings, your beliefs, your past, your hurts, your pains, I will know you better. I will understand you better. If I reveal to you things about me, you will understand why I do certain things and don't do other things, why I say things a certain way and not another way. If the Bible is a revelation of God, God's revealing God's self to us, then it is an ongoing process, never fully complete, which is why we can read the scriptures over and over again, and we learn more and more and think, why did I not see that before? It builds upon itself as God reveals God's self to us deeper and deeper the more we spend time seeking to know who God is. You see, the Israelites understood that God had revealed God's self to them as their God who loved them and would protect them. But they did not understand that that love of God and that protection of God was for all of humanity they had an incomplete revelation. And Christ comes in the New Testament to reveal God's self to us more fully. And yet the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth that we still only see through a glass dimly. The more we read Scripture and spend time in Scripture, the more of God will be revealed to us and the more we will understand who God is, God's will and God's purpose for our lives in this world. And the second concept that has helped me is the word foundation. We often hear that the Bible is the foundation of our faith and sometimes we think of a foundation as bricks, like building a building, a brick is a solid and sure foundation. But the thing about bricks is they have limits. You can't stretch or pull or flex a brick at all or it will crumble and fall apart. So maybe a better image of the foundation of our faith is more like a trampoline. A trampoline that has spring to it. So if we think we understand something and then we fall, our fall is cushioned. It's okay to question things. We don't get hurt. We can doubt and ask questions. And our fall will be cushioned, but not just cushioned. We'll also spring back up into life again out into the world again, ready to start again. See, the thing about bricks is we build walls with them and we build buildings with them and we start defending our bricks, which means that we say, well, these people are in and these people are out. This belief is allowed and this one is not. These questions are okay to ask, and these questions are not. But the thing about understanding our foundation more like a trampoline is to understand we can ask those questions and we can flex as more and more of God is revealed to us in our lives. Have I told you the story about a young boy who was turning 16 and he wanted a car. He asked his parents for the car and his father said, well, I think that 
you know, if, if you will do these three things, we can give you a car, son. And the son said, oh, that's great. What do I need to do? And he said, well, I've noticed your grades at school have been dropping, so you're going to have to study a little bit harder and bring your grades back up. And the second thing that I've noticed is that you don't want to get up on Sunday mornings to go to church with us anymore. So you're going to have to start getting up, son, and going to church with us. It's important for us to go to church as a family. But the third thing I want you to do is, I've noticed you don't read your Bible ever at all anymore. So I want you to start reading your Bible. Oh, and then there's one more thing. And the son said, one more thing? He goes, yeah. That hair of yours, it's gotten way too long. You're going to have to cut your hair. And then we'll buy you a car. The son said, oh, okay. Six months passed. Report cards came out. Son came to his father and he said, Dad, look at my report card. I want you to see how many A's and B's I have. Not a C, nor a D in sight. A's and B's all the way through. This proves I've been studying hard, been doing what you wanted, and bringing my grades up. Father said, yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. He said, and you know, I've been going to church with you and mom every single Sunday since you told me to for the past six months. I've been there every single Sunday. And the father said, yeah, that's right. And the son said, and I've been reading my Bible every night. You can look at it. You can see how I've got it marked up, highlights all over it, notes tucked in it. I've been reading my Bible. And the father said, yeah, that's great. I'm proud of you, son. I'm really proud of you. And the son said, so can I have my car? And the dad said, no. You didn't get your hair cut. And the son said, well, that's the thing, Dad. You know, I've been reading my Bible here, and guess what? Jesus had long hair. And the dad said, yep. But you know what, son? If you keep on reading your Bible, you'll also see that Jesus walked everywhere. It's amazing what you find out when you read the Bible. Read it for ourselves, my friends. Read it for ourselves because there is so much misunderstanding of the scriptures. And there is a difficulty because of the ancient languages, which is why we offer things like disciple Bible study. It's written in a different culture, as Dane told, told the children over 1,500 years over 40 different writers, different types of literature. So engage with one another in a Sunday school class or come to Austin or myself and say, hey, we want to learn more. What can we do? What resources are available? There are resources available to help us, to help us get closer to God and closer to one another as we plug into the Bible. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.